you don't even play. You will fall. If this says, let me tell you this. Hold on, I want you to hear this too. Second Ezra, chapter, chapter 6, verse 54. You get out the grave and culture on God. You are a fault. Whom thou made us Lord. You get out the grave. You get out the grave. You get out the grave. You get Esau is the end of the world. We, got that, we can get that information from 2 Ezra chapter 6, verse 9. In the Apocrypha, it says, For Esau is the end of the world, and Jacob is the beginning of that, that follower. One man was righteous, one man was unrighteous. That's all that this is saying. What two men represent. Esau represents the unrighteousness. Jacob represents the righteousness. Shalom and welcome to another episode of GMS in Transit, where we prophesy on the, on the road. And we're going to continue in the book of the Apocrypha, uh, Second Ezra, the 15th chapter. And I believe we left off at the uh, 14th verse. We're going to start at the 12th verse. All right, all praise to Yahweh, Hashem, Yahusha. Double honors to the elders of Great Millstone. All right, this is Second Ezra 14 and 14. Let go from thee mortal thoughts. Cast away the burdens of man. Put off now the weak nature. All right, because the time we're living in is the time that we're supposed to get strong. All right, because our enemy, the so-called white man, according to the scriptures, he's planning to destroy our people. Not just the two-thirds of the elected nation of Israel. Hello, LeBert here, and thank you for joining me. May this video be a blessing to you, and may it honor and glorify God in His kingdom. This video is going to be an introduction to the book known by some as Second Ezra and by others for Ezra. Ezra is the Greek equivalent of the name Ezra. So, Second Ezra, Ezra, is the teaching of the visions that Ezra, the prophet Ezra, received from God. Second Ezra, chapter 6, verse 7. Then answered I and said, What shall be the parting asunder of the times? Or when shall be the end of the first, and the beginning of it that followeth? And he said unto me, From Abraham unto Isaac, when Jacob and Esau were born of him, Jacob's hand held first the heel of Esau. For Esau is the end of the world, and Jacob is the beginning of it that follows. So we understand what that means now. Our forefather taking the heel of Esau represented what? Read it again, verse 9. For Esau is the end of the world. Esau represents the end of the world, meaning they would be the last empire ruling before Christ returns. Shalom, everybody out there. It's Brother LeVar. Coming back at y'all again, talking about the second Ezra. And as you guys can see, this book is being used by plenty of people out there. It's not just among Hebrews like camps, but obviously you can see there was a Caucasian male who used this particular book. Um, and he claims that Ezra was a prophet of the Most High God. And others are using this book as a means to promote their racism. But we're gonna get right into why we at ABT, or Absolute Bible Truth, do not accept this book. I was going all online to find out the opinions of a lot of scholars and things of that nature. So this is one article I got and it says here, scholars agree that Second Ezra is actually a compilation of three separate works none of which have anything to do with the time of Ezra. The prophet Ezra is a visionary in these writings. In the first section, chapters 1 and 2, Ezra basically affirms a rejection of the Jews in favor of the Christian church. It is believed that Christians wrote these chapters themselves, probably around the middle of the 2nd century CE. Second section is the longest and is comprised of chapters 3 through 14. 
This is an apocalyptic composition that addresses God's plans for the future of Israel. It is believed that Jews wrote this piece around 100 CE. The last two chapters, 15 and 16, are the third section. This was also written by Christians and is thought to be even later than the first section, possibly written in the third century CE. It is comprised of oracles of doom addressed to the enemies of God's people who are now represented by the Christian church. What's so amazing about this is when people are reading the book of Second Ezra, they're getting a theme of Christianity um, when they read Second Ezra as if the Jews or the Jews' faith is no longer in place established by the Most High. So when people are reading this stuff, they're seeing a theme of Christianity in 2nd Ezra. And rightfully so, because when you read 2nd Ezra, it has a Christian feel to it. Now the thing about it is, Ezra didn't live in the time after Jesus Christ. Ezra lived during the Babylonian period, during, you know, right after the exile, when the Jews left ancient Babylon. So that right there in itself is a red flag. Now in a little bit, we're going to read out of the book of 2nd Ezra, and I've never heard any of these racist black Hebrew Israelites read uh, the particular scriptures that I'm going to go to, and you guys are going to see for yourself that this part of 2nd Ezra is completely false and when we read it I want you guys to just have an open mind just take it for what it's saying you're gonna see exactly what I'm talking about but right here this is a chart that's compiled of uh, all the books that's in the Bible as far as the Old Testament you got of course in red you got the Torah the first five books of Moses and you got the history in the orange comprising of the time of Joshua when he led the children of Israel into the land of Canaan to settle in that land and then you got the time of the judges where God sent judges among the Israelites who were the leaders of Israel and then you got the history of uh, Ruth the Moabite you got first and second Samuel and the Kings and Chronicles and this is the time period in which the, the Hebrew people wanted a king just like the other nations had. And of course you have Ezra, okay, and Nehemiah uh, during the time of the Babylonian captivity. And then you see right here, Esther's also in the histories. But then you have this section where it's called Deuterocanon in yellow, and it's pointing towards Tobit, Judith, and uh, Esther also because what people don't know is when you read the uh, Septuagint version of Esther, there's actually uh, more to read than your uh, regular KJV. There's actually a little bit more in scripture. But um, it, these other books, Tobit and Judith, is a part of the Apocrypha. And I didn't know, I didn't even know anything about an apocrypha uh, when I first start getting serious. And you see on the right hand side the book of uh, the Wisdom of Solomon, uh, Sirach, which is also called Ecclesiasticus, uh, Baruch, and uh, Daniel also, because like just like uh, the book of Esther, it also has more that is contained uh, in the writings of Daniel and uh, also Psalms 151 through 155 at the top so these are the apocryphal books that the Septuagint had now when, when you look over there on the left at the bottom you have first and second Ezra now I have myself and uh, Septuagint with the Apocrypha in it. It doesn't have second Esther's. 
this was another red flag for me because I'm thinking to myself, how come my Apocrypha doesn't have second Ezra's? And then once I began to read second Ezra's online, I began to understand why in this particular time in history, a lot of these Septuagints don't have a second Ezra's in it. And like I said before, we are gonna read about why this book is not in the list of uh, Old Testament scriptures, if you will. Now for my people who are not familiar with uh, the books of the Apocrypha, basically this is the time period in between the Old Testament and the New Testament. There's like a 400 uh, year gap of time frame that is not uh, spoken of, but these are the books in which it explained when the Israelites were being ruled by the Greeks. Okay, now right here, I want you guys to get uh, some clarification on what it means for these books to be deuterocanonical books, the, 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 the apocryphal books that I just named uh, on that chart. And it says here, first and second Maccabees aren't included in the Protestant Old Testament, but Catholics and most Orthodoxes consider them canon. Canon simply means list. Okay. They weren't in the Hebrew Bible, thus they're called deuterocanonical as opposed to protocanonical. As Raffink points out in his answer, these books were written later than the protocanonical books and thus couldn't be included in the Hebrew Bible. Protestants consider deuterocanonical books Old Testament apocrypha, i.e. books that don't have divine authority but are relevant with regard to pre-New Testament history. Martin Luther said about them, Apocrypha, that are books which are not considered equal to the Holy Scriptures, but are useful and good to read. Useful and good to read, but not divinely inspired according to Protestants. And see, this is one of the main issues that I have when you talk about church history and early church fathers like Martin Luther and a lot of other men who I consider as heretics because if you read the Apocrypha and uh, Brother Josh, our head teacher at Absolute Bible Truth, did a whole lesson on the teachings of Jesus, okay? The teachings of Jesus found in the Apocrypha. The, the same list of books that Martin Luther said were useful but not equal to holy scriptures or equal to being good as the Old Testament or not considered to be divinely inspired. But the thing about it is, and if Jesus was using the Apocrypha, and we can prove that, how in the world is this man going to jump up and say that these books are not divinely inspired? Now, it's, it's crazy to me that a person can jump up and make a statement about some books that he just basically has a bias to it. You don't consider them divinely inspired. Why? Because you might not have understanding. Because when Brother Josh did the lesson, it was crystal clear that Jesus Christ understood the Apocrypha and not only Jesus Christ, but his disciples indeed because the class was crystal clear. I hope to God one day that the brother will go ahead and just upload that class to YouTube because everybody needs to hear it. So basically what I'm trying to say is when early church fathers or whatever try to make the claim that these deuterocanonical books or these apocryphal books are not divinely inspired, they are mistaken. But the one that I'm attacking wasn't even in the original Septuagint in the first place. Because when I read that article for you guys, most scholars was dating this stuff after the first century okay you talking about a time where the Jews were converting other nations into the faith of Jesus Christ and this is when the Christianity emerged and a lot of scholars have looked at second Ezra's and they like yo this stuff ain't lining up with the time of the Babylonian exile and I'm about to go right now and show you what they were reading.
let's look at 2 Ezra chapter 5. And we're going to read verses 4 through 8. And it reads, But if the Most High grant thee to live, thou shalt see after the third trumpet that the sun shall suddenly shine again in the night. Hold on. The sun shall suddenly shine again in the night. If anybody could just inbox me and give me your interpretation on that, I would greatly appreciate it. That does not make any sense. And the moon thrice in the day. So the moon gonna shine in the day three times, okay? And the blood shall drop out of wood. Somebody please inbox me who has answers for this stuff, right? And the stone shall give his voice and the people shall be troubled. And even he shall rule whom they look not for that dwell upon the earth and the fowl shall take their flight away together. And the Sodomitish sea shall cast out fish and make a noise in the night, which may have, which many have not known. But they shall all hear the voice thereof. There shall be a confusion also in many places. And the fire shall be off sent out again. And the wild beasts shall change their places. And mistress women shall bring forth monsters. You see what I'm talking about? This is, this is one of the reasons why it's hard for me to accept this book. Now let's go to um, this false prophecy given about the Messiah. Let's go to 2 Ezra chapter number 7. We're going to read verses 26 through verse number 33. Now check this out. It says here, Behold, the time shall come that these tokens which I have told thee shall come to pass, and the bride shall appear, and she coming forth shall be seen, that now is withdrawn from the earth, and whosoever is delivered from the foresaid evils shall see my wonders. For my son Jesus shall be revealed with those that be with him, and they that remain shall rejoice within 400 years. Y'all see what I'm talking about? The Bible mentions nothing about Jesus doing anything for 400 years. Okay? Jesus didn't even live for 400 years. I mean, what is this talking about? And think about this. When the Bible gives a prophecy about Jesus, it never says his name verbatim. Like, this. that's why I took you guys to what scholars say about this written work being written in the time of the common era, AD, you know, after Christ died, because they're giving his name for Christ's sake. Check this out. Let's go to verse uh, 29. It says, after three years shall my son Christ die. Hold on. Y'all know that the Old Testament don't even read like that. When you read the Apocrypha, none of the books read like that, okay? And it says, after three years shall my son Christ die, and all men that have life, and the world shall be turned into the old silence seven days, like as in the former judgments, so that no man shall remain. And after seven days, the world that yet awaketh not shall be raised up, and that shall die that is corrupt. And the earth shall restore those that are asleep in her. And so shall the dust, those that dwell in silence. And the secret places shall deliver those souls that were committed unto them. And the Most High shall appear upon the seat of judgment. And misery shall pass away. And the long suffering shall have an end. Again, this is why we don't accept this book. It's giving you a prophecy about Christ, okay? And it mentioned him by name. You cannot read Christ's name being given throughout the scriptures. I mean, even in Revelation 19, he's called the word of God, okay? I mean, Isaiah 42, the, the, I mean, Psalm 110, David didn't know his name. Daniel chapter 7, he's called the son of man, and so on and so forth. This is why we do not accept this book, because how are you going to give a prophecy of the son and mention him by name? Another red flag is the fact that 
you know, when you read the Bible and you read the Old Testament, Ezra, who is the same person as supposedly been writing first, second Ezra's, because Ezra's is just uh, the Greek equivalent of Ezra. Ezra is said in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 2, it says there that he is a priest. And then when you skip down to verse 4, it says Ezra is a scribe. So he's a priest and a scribe. How all of a sudden in this book they make him a prophet? Because prophets prophesy things. Ezra was not a prophet. But in this book, he is made into a prophet. So these men stand on these street corners using this false book, trying to promote their hate, need to sit down and shut up because they ain't done their homework. And if any of them guys can jump on my page and give me some clarification to what I read, it will be greatly appreciated. But you can't. It's a false book. Historically, people don't accept it as a writing that come from the time that Ezra and Nehemiah was on the scene after the Babylonian captivity. And the verses I read are just flat out phony. With all that said, y'all, thank y'all for viewing this video. Peace.